apostolic teaching. Paul puts it this way. Whether, whether then when you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all what? For the glory of God. So he's not saying, you're, 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 I, I worship here and then I go work here. He's saying everything you do should be an act of worship unto the Lord. You're an integrated being. He also says it in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So you'll see it, it, they, they saw this interconnectedness of everything that they did in life. Uh, one, one, uh, one Hebrew tradition, and obviously it's not applicable today, but this is, how, this is the view of reality that they had. This, this one uh, scholar said, a woman need not come to the synagogue because in taking care of her family, she has worshipped God in that day. All the women said amen to that one. <laughs> That's right. I'm worshiping the Lord. That's why I'm not here. You know? <laughs> so you'll see something here. You'll see this played out here. Uh, if you're following along, look at uh, Genesis 2, verse 15 and 17. The Lord God placed the man in the garden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. You are sure to die. Now notice he tells them, in believing, in acting, in something that I've called you not to do, it is death. So keep that in mind in your life. Any beliefs that you embrace, anything contrary to the word of God that you embrace is death. And then look at Genesis 2, verse 25. Now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's an interesting verse. Always been an interesting verse to me because the, the, the writer there is trying to teach us something about Adam's perception. Adam is trusting God. Notice before this, or, or we know that every part of his perception of God was correct up until this moment. So because he's seeing God correctly and trusting God correctly, his view of his wife is not tainted with any tainting that we have in the world system today. Some people think, you don't find it expressly in the scripture, some people think that there was such a glory there, they couldn't actually see each other's bodies. I don't know for sure. I just know that they saw each other exactly as God intended them to see each other. Now look at Genesis 3. So keep also in mind that you, you, are, you are a being that is created to learn. Won't read it tonight because we're focusing on something else, but part of the way we're supposed to learn is through knowledge, the knowledge of God. We are supposed to hear, trust in what we're hearing, and act on what we've heard from God. And then in seeing things, seeing God operate through us, doing things we've never done before, it is to build our confidence in the Lord. How do we know that? David said the testimonies of the Lord are sure and forever. It's supposed to give you confidence in the God that you serve, and you're supposed to grow and do. Th Notice the first act that they ever did was something that they never did before. Like, you should be constantly being challenged to do things you've never done before. Yeah. Yeah. So you learn that way. You learn correct things that way, but you also learn lies that way. Mm. Look at Genesis 3 now. Now, the serpent was more... I'm reading the NIV here. I don't know why I just read out of it this week. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the, other, uh, any of the wild animals and the Lord, God, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did you really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now this is really important. The road to death begins by questioning what God has clearly stated. The road to death begins 
by questioning what God has clearly said. God has already made this clear and also realize they have full authority over the one who's speaking to them and challenging God. And I just say that because there, there are, the, the, most people don't end up in a ditch quickly. They begin just by a little leaven. Starts with a little offense. Starts with, well, you know, you know, maybe, maybe God just loves all people. He does, but watch where it gets twisted. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, God, but did God say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. So, so notice the inability to directly address the lie opens a whole dialogue that is all lies. That's why you got to shut that thing down. Immediately. Yep. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to a woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. They're already God-like. He's offering them something that God has already given them. Yeah. We know better than God. Oh, come on. You know, God told you to wait on that thing, but go ahead and do it, you know. When the woman saw that, notice she heard, she allowed it to meditate, and that dialogue continued. Most of the dialogue that you will have in these areas will be internal. When the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, and she looked now, she looked. Instead of being governed by revelation knowledge, the enemy tempts her to be governed by the senses. And we'll notice here something here. Something. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it. She also gave some for her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open. Now, he's not talking about their physical eyes. He's talking about the eyes of their heart. One chapter before that, we don't know how much time has gone by. The eyes of their heart are seeing each other perfectly pure. The eyes have now switched. Now you'll notice it's one lie that they believe. One lie. The eyes of both were open and they realized they were naked. So now they have an awareness of something they were never supposed to have an awareness of. So they sewed fig trees together and they made coverings for themselves. Now notice one of the first characteristics of believing a lie is immediately you seek to take care of yourself when God is always meant to be your source of all things. What do I do? I'm going to do something quick. You know? That's why I don't kill people so much when they make one mistake because usually there's another mistake coming after it to fix the mistake that you know you shouldn't have made because you're embarrassed you made it. <laughs> I'm not saying either mistake is right. I'm just saying I understand it. Most people who commit adultery don't stand up and confess it. They get caught. Uh -huh. Anyway, that's... <laughs> And so we've seen the, the anatomy of learning and acting. She listened, she opened the door to death in her life, she reasoned, she looked, and she acted. Adam didn't govern the situation e either, and he simply did what his wife told him to do. Their eyes were open, the, their view of reality changed and the belief in one lie caused every aspect of man to be damaged. Every part of him here is damaged. Every part of him. One lie. One lie has the effect on damaging every part of who you are. 
The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves from the Lord among the trees. Now notice this. God has not changed his commitment to them. God has not changed his commitment to them. He wants to come near. He's going, I'm still here. You, you did something you shouldn't do, it, but I'm still here. That's good news. <laughs> But notice their perception of him, even though he is coming close to them, their perception of themselves and of him is now shifted. So their ability to trust him, notice their perception has changed. It, you, you would think like, I just, I, I believe the lie about my aunt, but that's going to affect every area of your life. But the Lord called them. Where are you? I love this. They can still hear his voice and they've made the worst mistake of their life. Listen to that voice when you've made a mistake. And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. Notice he's having emotions God never meant to have for him. He was never meant to be afraid of God. His emotions are damaged. Because I was naked, so I hid. All sorts of layered things come with being afraid. Guilt, shame, regret, the replaying of the mistake. The enemy loves that. I mean, he's the king of witchcraft, right? Mm -hmm. You repented of something 18 years ago, and he reminds you of it on the way to church today. You know, <laughs> It's witchcraft. God doesn't remember it anymore. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Now notice this. I had to tie my shoe. Notice this. What does he do? He blames. I want you to see something in his next series of verses. All the fruit of believing one lie is still in effect in trying to capture the hearts of believers today. Victim mentality. Wasn't me. Someone else. And I always point that out because victim mentality is very, very subtle sometimes. It's not like, you know, we all know the, the really like we know when we're thinking, but those little things, I got looked over. They didn't treat me right here. It's not working for me. They were not nice to me in that church. All these things that make you think in just even a small place as a victim of your circumstance. I was thinking about this last week even how the enemy works in the language of culture, even among believers, right? We know there is a process, right, to grow into maturity in God. It's a process, right? But then we say someone fell into sin. Falling into sin is a process too. But notice how we try and just make it, oh, it just sort of happened. So we even label mistakes in victimization. Right. Come on. So I say beware of any place of a victim. Now watch this. This is really important. And Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat the dust in the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and others. And he will crush your head and he will strike his heel. Now notice the first person to face consequences is the enemy. And it's the first promise of the Messiah. He's a defeated foe. He's like, you won this one. 
but I already got the champion on the way. To the woman, he said, I will make you pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. You will, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit, ate fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from him. And to the woman, he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. You. Now, I want you to notice this because I read these verses to say that all the effects of what happened in that garden are still in effect in the earth today. They're all still happening. And part of the reason I emphasize that is because that we have to realize the, the depth to which God intended man to live and the depth to which we have all come to because of Adam's mistake. You don't get many amends for that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. To Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree which I commanded, you must not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it in all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food and until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken from the dust, and the dust you will return. Verse 22, And the Lord said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now notice that the belief doesn't immediately end his natural life. He was created to live forever. So now... He actually has to learn how to die, but that one lie is already causing death on the inside of him. The reason I emphasize that is because I want to emphasize this, and I felt the Lord would have us emphasize. Each of us has received the fruit of Adam's choice. Every person in this room. We were affected by this choice. We were born in a state God never intended for humanity, separated from God. We were born into a belief system that was, I call, learned dysfunction. We were, we were, we were born into something that God never intended. We were, we, were, we were born even into a life that was not even our own choices. So but here's a good news for you. Your choices affect generations to come. I wrote in my, my journal the other day, what will future generations live because of the choices I make? Now here's the good news. The good news is each one of us can receive from the fruit of Jesus' choice. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Luke 2.10. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be what? For all people. The good news is you were born into a really dysfunctional state. You were born where uh, every part of you was damaged. You were born, even, even you were really beautiful, you were still born damaged. And the good news is, God did not leave you damaged. Amen. So one of God's greatest passions is to retrain you from your dysfunction. The challenge is, Many people do not recognize how much dysfunction they were born into before they came into the kingdom of God. Not you, the person behind you. <laughs> Our born again experience gives us the privilege of divine placement. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But whoever, I, read, I mentioned this the other, uh, a few moments ago, but whoever is united with the Lord is one, is one with him in spirit. 
Romans 8, Christ has raised from the dead, and we know he cannot die again. Death has no power over him. Yes, when Christ died, he died to defeat the power of sin one time, enough for all. He now has a new life, and his new life is with God. In the same way, you should see yourselves as dead to the power of sin and alive with God through Christ Jesus. And then Jesus prayed this interesting thing before he left the earth. I do not pray for these alone, but I pray also who will, those who will be, who who will believe in me through your word, that they all may be one as you father are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us. So born again, one of the ways you translate that word born again is to come back to the top, to live over. And he prays that the same positioning that I lived on this earth in union with you, never separated, I'm praying that they would understand that this is the place that I lived in on the earth, fully God, fully man, I now invite them into this place. I invite them into this place to live from the very same place of glory that I lived in, even though I lived in the same world that they'll live in. Also really good news, in the kingdom of God, you get everything up front. It's not like you got to behave better and get more. It's like you, everything is yours now. By which we've been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son of his love. So what does he do? According to apostolic language again, he says we're seated with him in heavenly places. So this is what he does. That old life that you had, all of that dysfunction, it was so bad, he didn't want to like do like a remodel on it. It was really, really bad. He's like, it's, uh, I could just see this because it said Jesus was the land slain before the very foundation of the world. Hey. So Adam is going to miss it. Jesus, what do you think? That It's going to be so bad, I'll have to die. So he dies, goes to hell, resurrects on the third day. The key part, too, is he ascends. Not just that he dies, but that he dies, resurrects, and ascends, so you can sit in that very same place as him. And you can sit there, not based on your own merit, right? But because of the righteousness of Christ that he gives you, right? Yes. He puts you right there, right now. He's giving you everything. Like, so as soon as you come into the kingdom, right? You have this door of inheritance. And then Psalm 139 says he has all these thoughts towards you. All these thoughts towards you. That are like the sand of the seashore. All these things relative to your life. All these things that would connect you with ideas, insights. You're like, you're like, I always say this, like whatever situation that you're in, he's got a solution for. You're like, I need money. I can help you with that. I keep making the same mistake over and over again. I can help you with that. I keep dating the wrong fools. I can help you with that. <laughs> I've been married six times. I can help you with that. <laughs> I keep running up my credit card. I can help you with that. My kid's on drugs. I can help you with that. So you have this unlimited inheritance. But the, the journey of discipleship, though, is, of course, isn't it? You have unlimited inheritance. It'll be your choice if you receive that inheritance. 
It'll be your choice. It'll be your choice. But the challenge is, you've been made royalty in God, but the overwhelming majority of us think like paupers, think incorrectly, think with great dysfunction. And so part of God's passion is to identify not only what is available to you, but to make you aware of the dysfunctions in your belief process. I like to say it like this. God's given you a new Mac, and you're still trying to operate with a Windows 95 operating system. Doesn't work. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is our example. And there's something really interesting that Jesus says about himself. He's got this life. He, 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 he was the greatest prophet that ever existed. There was no greater prophet than himself. But his goal was not to be the greatest prophet. His goal was to obey and fulfill purpose and in doing so became the greatest prophet. Whoa. <clears throat> he was always in the right place at the right time in the right season. His life of intimacy with the Lord did not begin when he began his ministry. It's what birthed his ministry. He was the greatest example of the whole man that ever existed. The woman with the issue of blood receives healing because he had healing on the inside of him. He said, don't look here, don't look there, for the kingdom of God is within you. It says, this is what he says about himself that's really fascinating. And it'll give us some understanding, I believe, of his passion for us. He said, well, let's just read it, John 14, 30. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in regard to me. Footnote from the ANSB said, he's got no ground of accusation in me. The man who modeled this oneness says the evil one has nothing in me. What's he saying? There's no agreement in my heart with anything that he has to offer.